it was something that took me a long time to learn, that vulnerability was a good thing and a bad thing. Rob Goffey wrote a book called Why Would Anyone Want to Be Led By You? And it, and it kind of delved into those issues around vulnerability being one of them yep. and transparency and honesty. Most people were very happy to work for someone that they believed was genuine and was telling them how it is, whether it was good or bad news. And that was one of the most powerful aligning tools. And they did a whole lot of empirical research on other, on other things that we you know what made leaders effective and what didn't. Graeme Hunt, welcome to the Mentalist Podcast. Uh, good morning, Dave. Great to be here. Yeah, great, great, great to have you in, and thanks for coming in. Looking forward to today's conversation. Um, and we might just sort of kick in. We've got a, a loose theme of leading from the front, so uh, looking forward to experiencing or sort of exploring some of your lived experience and how maybe that leading from the front examples uh, shone brightly through. And I can see it coming through in a few examples we're having in just the conversation before we got started and hit record. So, so Graham, maybe let's just sort of set the scene. Let's um, to to a point in your career, and then maybe we can sort of backtrack a little bit around how you've how you've gotten into these positions or being nominated or uh, forced in or parachuted into these scenarios. Um, so you're the CEO of AGL. There's an individual uh, or a group that's trying to buy one of Australia's biggest you know, utility retailers uh, and power delivery businesses. Um, that sounds like a complex scenario. Why were you the right person or how did you find yourself in that role and if someone's listening in, what do I have to do, like what Graham did, to then be able to be in such a scenario and position? <laughs> yeah, well, I guess I'd say by either you get lucky or you get unlucky, depending right. on which way you look at it. Uh, look, it's a complex uh, uh, story. Um, I, I found myself as the CEO and managing director, um, and I'd stood down from the chairman position. And that's quite unusual. Um but not unheard of in certain circumstances. And, and in, in my view, this was one of those circumstances. And probably more importantly than that, in the view of the rest of the board, it was the right decision at the time. So to try to set the scene, um, AGL had embarked on a strategy that had been developed by um, the previous CEO and managing director to demerge the company right. into, into two parts. Um, one, the, the fossil fuel generating um, uh, business uh, centred around uh, primarily coal-fired generation in, in New South Wales and, uh, and Victoria uh, and some, uh, some gas-fired generation as well. And then the second part was going to be the renewables generation and the retail business. Um, the reason for that was a pretty clear business case that the company was being undervalued because of the fact that uh, it had that mix of both uh, traditional fossil fuel generation and, and green assets. And if it was split, then the, the green and retail business would have traded at a higher multiple. Right. And the fossil fuel business would have continued to have be a tough business, but could have been managed through to the natural retirement of those so those, uh, pretty those traditional M&A tactic of yeah. taking a so, valuable yeah, asset yeah. and putting in a separate so, yeah. structure. Okay. Exactly. So one part of the business was an anchor on the rest. And yep. if you separate it, you unlock some value. And you allow two management teams to focus on two very different strategies and create more value for shareholders. Yep. So, um, you know, how did I end up as a CEO? I was the chairman of the board that supported the then CEO's uh, strategy to, to split the company. But just before we were kind of ready to formally... Uh, launch, and I mean very just before, right. the CEO decided that he didn't really want to be the CEO of either of those two merged entities. And we were already locked and loaded, and um, we had to make a decision, you know, which way forward. And, and the, the, the outcome was that um, someone had to step into the breach and lead the company through that demerger process. Yep. And the... Um, my colleagues around the board table asked me to do it. Um, and, uh, you know, I had very deep operational experience and I'd had significant M&A 
uh, transformational experience in the past. Um, and so I stepped down from chair to CEO and managing director. Um, uh, Peter Botton, one of the other board members, stepped into the, the vacant chair role. Yeah. And we we um, moved forward to try to get the demerger away. How do, what, what sort of time period are we talking? Because that sounds like pretty significant you know, title changes, role changes. Are we talking about a week or months? Or? Uh, no, look, it happened very quickly uh, because, as I said, we were kind of locked and loaded with uh, ready to go to the market. And we reached the conclusion that it didn't make sense for the incumbent CEO and manager director to continue on being charged with a demerger that he'd let yeah. everyone, let us know that he really didn't want to be a part of. He believed yeah. in the strategy, but he didn't want to be in either of those organisations. Yeah. So it made more sense to hand the baton over. Uh, and so this was one of those things where there were board meetings very late into the night and decisions were made, you know, within hours and days, not yeah. not weeks and months. And so just sort of, I mean, with the theme of leading from the front, we're sort of talking about a, you know, a long and rewarding career and I would have probably labelled you as in your NED phase of your career. So, you know, maybe a portfolio of a couple of different things. And then I think if, you know, you're the last one back from the toilet and then you're, um, it's on the hot, it's on the table that you would, you would be the best candidate of, uh, from your, your board peers. Yeah. Yeah. I think, uh, I, I think it's, you know, it was all situational dependent. Um, I think boards, um, if they've got a proper eye on succession, uh, always like to put someone in the role that's going to be in the role for a significant period of time. Mm. But in certain circumstances, when the proverbial hits the fan um, and you look around the room and you say, what are our options? Sometimes you've got to go kind of back to the future a little bit yeah. and, uh, and, and put someone into a role that can hit the ground running and it's got the experience to deal with the challenges of the time. Um, you know, so I went into the role, I spent, you know, the best part of two years in it and then ultimately handed over the reins to Damien Nix, who's now the CEO, is doing a great job. Mm. Um, rightly or wrongly, the assessment of the board at that period of time was that Damien wasn't quite ready um, and Damien had already been kind of anointed to be the CFO of one of the emerged entities. So to, to, to take him out of that and have him step up into yep. the other role didn't make a lot of sense. Um, so I was asked to do it and, uh, as people have said to me, uh, along my career journey, sometimes I'm like a moth to, the, to a flame. Um, I could see what needed to be done. Um, it was going to be tough and I guess I was prepared to have a go. And, yep. um, you know, I stepped in, it was a rocky journey. Um, didn't end, uh, particularly well in the end because of the, uh, the fact that there was an activist investor that stepped in to stop the demerger. Right. And uh, we had to pull the demerger strategy. And as a result of that, I stepped away. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, certainly I were moth to a flame. You couldn't think of a scenario that's more from just such a disruptive, I mean, even if you think, you know, your own career, you're, you're, you're into this NED phase and now bang, you're back into what's probably a 70-hour work week CEO gig that's, very demanding demerger plus BAU plus an active investor trying to, you know, stop the demerger that's quite influential. Yeah. Well, well, I think, I think, um, I guess I've never been one for, you know, walking away from a challenge. Um, but also I just find it much more rewarding to be, um, to be challenged and to be involved. Hmm. Um, you know, the concept of a uh, a passive type NED portfolio of activities just kind of doesn't get me there. Um, I, you know, I yeah. need some things where I can be intellectually stimulated um, and can see that I'm making a difference. And, you know, more and more as my career has gone on, making that difference has been also about helping up-and-comers, um, you know, yeah. leverage off the scars and the experience that I've got rather yep. than um, have to suffer their own to learn. Yep. And we've had you uh, touring the country talking to in our mastermind groups and uh, sharing those, I was going to say sharing those wounds, but sharing those stories and um, experiences, which has been fantastic. Um, okay. So fourth generation steel worker, 
uh, 17, was it 17 out of school straight into work. Like maybe let's just sort of follow some of these themes through because I, I think there's a bit of a leading from the front or moss to the flame, as you say, that's, I'd like to sort of tease out where that came from. Um, yeah. Um, look, you know, back in the, in the day and we're talking in the seventies, so it's a long time ago now, um, um, you know, starting with BHP as a, as a trainee or a cadet, the model in those days was that you came straight out of high school, um, got a traineeship, mm. um, uh, started working and the company gave you, uh, you know, a day off a, a week to go to university. So it took you, you know, it took you twice as long to get your qualifications, but you started earning, mm. you know, money as you went. And, um, you know, it was a, at a time of, uh, pretty much full employment, not in many ways, not greatly dissimilar to where we are today. That's interesting. Um, and high inflation, actually much higher inflation than today. But um, that meant that, you know, uh, companies were looking to bring people into their workforce early on. And it was an effective model because you started to learn kind of leadership and life skills alongside the academic stuff. So, you know, by the time that, uh, you know, as a 17 year old straight out of high school, um, you know, I was, I was doing the, you know, kind of the maths one and engineering one at, at university during, during the day, but then yep. I was working shift work and, uh, you know, and pretty quickly got into a role where I had a very junior kind of leadership position on, uh, you know, as an assistant shift foreman, um, you know, trying, <laughs> trying to get, uh, yeah guys who are old enough to be a grandfather to listen to you. Um, and I'm sure they just sniggered and, and uh, you know, did what they wanted anyway. But it was, a, yep. it was an interesting learning experience. Well, I mean, I imagine, you know, and then I'm skipping around a lot, but then back as, let's say, CEO of AGL, going to site or something, you would, you would have a greater appreciation for, I guess, who your workforce is and, um, yeah, maybe – to, yeah, look, uh, very much so. I mean, I always feel like, um, uh, you know, even in a boardroom position or as a CR or a senior leader, that uh, putting the safety boots on and the and the fluoro vest and the and the safety hat um, is a sign of a you know an honest day's work, if you like, as opposed to sitting in a boardroom somewhere, you know, pontificating about the strategy of the company. So I think I think that that's helped me a lot um, really understand and relate to people across across businesses. So I've always been very comfortable about standing up, um, you know, in the crib room, talking to people about, mm. you know, very difficult things sometimes about, you know, why why a business needs to downsize or why a plant needs to close or or whatever. Um, but, you know, lots of, uh, lots of directors sometimes uh, and senior managers are a bit uncomfortable doing that because they didn't have that grounding. Yeah, and I think that's that was one of the great advantages of the system that existed at that point in time. Is you know you kind of, you know, you started the shop floor and worked your way up literally. Because I, I guess I mean starting it into sort of manufacturing and thinking from the seventies where Australia's manufacturing was and where it's gone to now, certainly is sort of an industry that you know generally speaking very much in decline. And then you've got the booming resources sector. When everything is sort of moving and changing so much, uh, is this a mock to the flame thing? Why did you end up sort of going through this path? Was it the challenge? Was it the struggle? Well, I, I, I guess it was just a natural thing to do. As as you said earlier, I mean, my um, my father had, was a metallurgist in the steel industry. My grandfather was a crane driver in the steel plant. When I retired from BHP, I discovered that my great-grandfather had been involved as a labourer in the construction of the Newcastle Steelworks. And, and that that model of, you know, traineeships where you could go to part-time university and earn a few bucks, um, and it was very few bucks uh, at the time, was kind of attractive. And, and I guess, um, you know, I, I, I'd never really considered kind of almost putting the pressure on my parents to say, well, I actually want to go away to university and kind of study something um, mm. uh, that was going to cost money. Now, I was lucky, again, that it was at the time uh, was the start of kind of free university education, although HECS started not long after that. Yeah. Uh, but you know, it wasn't 
where it was before. So it just seemed like a natural thing to do. Um, yeah, and, and I don't think really I was that... Uh, I was probably fairly ignorant about what other options I had. It just seemed like something that I fell into. Yeah. Um, and a lot of a lot of uh, you know, a lot of kids did the same thing at that point in time. Yeah, and it's, I mean it's a it's a different sort of progression into the workforce now. You you sort of let's say you're a 23 year old and you're coming in. And you've had you know your high school and you've had your university, but your your experience of like you mentioned, managing, being a foreman on site, managing people that have been there and older than your father, I think you mentioned. It's a different sort of experience. And you're right, these graduate programs aren't really available anymore or as readily available as... as it's, uh, yeah. Yeah, well, the companies have graduate programs, but they start with someone, you know, as a graduate. So, so they right. just expect most people to do their full-time university and whatever. And universities, I guess, um, are not as accommodating as they used to be around part-time students. Um, uh, and uh, and the decline of the manufacturing sector, et cetera, has meant that there probably aren't as many opportunities as there were at that point in time. So when I when I started at the uh, in Port Kemba at, at the Steelworks, there was 25,000 people employed at the plant. Gosh. And there was a hundred and something class of a hundred trainees as graduate metallurgists started. And when I finished six years later, there was only six of us that graduated. So the attrition rate was pretty high. Yep. Um, uh, but it was a, it was just a different time. And I think, you know, so it, it, whether or not it would work today, I'm not too sure about, but there was a lot of benefit yep. from it from my perspective. We had uh, we had a recent session with uh, James Fazzino. He was talking about steel being. He nicknamed it to his chair of manufacturing Australia, but called it the electric steel. Or is that is that correct? Or is that what they call it, electric steel? Because the the amount of electricity you need to create steel is so high that. Uh, yeah, well, that and uh, uh, aluminium. Aluminium, they say, is, is uh, solidified that's electricity. Right. That's right. Uh, yeah, and that yeah. that was a business that I went into later on. I ran BHP Billiton's aluminium business for a few years based out of London. So it was, uh, yeah, it's, you know, one of a number of commodities that is very energy hungry Yeah, and um, makes makes a big difference uh, what the energy cost and availability is to whether or not that business succeeds. Yeah, and I'm just conscious if we go into energy, I know there's so much to dig into, but uh, it's interesting sort of looking back at your career and sort of thinking, okay, well, it started in the steelworks, 25,000 people, and then those tr those manufacturing roles have now sort of shifted to where the lower cost of energy is. Um, yeah, I mean, I'd be interested to uh, to get your perspective around where energy prices are going. Um, you know, if you listen to maybe... Uh, a news reporter on what the government might be saying. They're talking about, you know, stabilising or potentially going backwards. Or I'd be interested, sort of, you know, what you're seeing as a as a bit of a trend out of curiosity. Yeah, well, uh, I think I think um, you know, there's there's only it's hard to defy gravity, and you know, mm. I, I think that you know that prices have got to go up to continue to support the build out of the um, the, the the energy transition. So, I mean, there's two ways of thinking about that. One is that our existing fossil fuel um, generating assets based around coal, which is, you know, what was the foundation of the electricity sector in the in, in Australia, particularly on the East Coast, as they age and get much closer to just having to close, um, then you've got to replace that with something. Mm -hmm. So, So you've not only got the fact that elect electrification is going to continue to increase, you've got to physically replace the generation capability that you have uh, yep. with your renewables. And then, you know, uh, coal-fired fi plant can operate 24-7, whereas a solar farm or a wind farm only operates when the sun's out or when the wind's blowing. So typically you need three times as much generating capacity of a renewable as you do from the coal plant. So yep. all of a sudden you've, you know, you can see where the extra capital is. And what makes it worse is that <clears throat> the best place to build solar farms and wind farms are not where the coal plants are. So right. you end up having to duplicate all your transmission and distribution 
yep. infrastructure. So someone's got to pay for all of that. And um, you know, the way the system works at the moment is that the investments that are made in that get passed through to either the consumer or the taxpayer. Yep. And one way or another, most of us are consumers and taxpayers. And so you end up, you know, it's just a question of which pocket the money's going to come out of. Yep. So while the, while the fuel cost of solar is free <clears throat> and uh, the same with wind, you've got to think about the overall capital cost of, of the overall investment. And, um, and you know, it's, it's exacerbated by the fact that um, we've got really good rooftop solar penetration in Australia, about 30-odd percent of per capita. But what that means is during the middle of the day, energy prices are about zero or negative on a sunny day because you're getting free electricity. The problem is that that's only for that period of time and people still want to, uh, you know, charge electric vehicles or run their washing machines or whatever, you know, yeah. when the sun's gone down. So that's, so that's got to come from somewhere. And so you've got this bizarre situation that really the only option we've got at the moment, uh, well, not the only option, but it relies heavily on fossil fuels being there for those yeah. you know, periods where the sun isn't shining and the wind isn't blowing until we can get more longer term storage, more batteries. Um, you know, some of the pumped hydro projects like Snowy project is well, you know, yeah. well over budget and, and significantly delayed. So that's not helping either. So all of that's going to lead to more pressure on energy prices. Yeah. And, and, and I mean, all of our, um, we, we sort of this conversation comes up in our mastermind sessions around you know each company and even individuals having their own plans for you know a, a transition in energy. Um, I just find it interesting that there's no national plan here in Australia. Do you think that's underway yeah, well, or is that? Yeah. <clears throat> Look, I think one of the biggest problems is that there isn't good national coordination. I mean, we've set decarbonisation targets nationally. Um, but one of the problems is really uh, to do with just the, the federation that, you know, each state has, mm. you know, its own, um, uh, historically, its own set of energy assets um, that have either been, you know, sold off or supplemented by private enterprise. And so yeah. there is, a, there is a, a, an overall um, market operator and there is there's Australia-wide regulation, et cetera. But it isn't as coordinated as it needs to be. And I think, you know, the analogy that I like to talk to is, you know, we need to kind of land the transition safely, which is a bit like trying to get a plane to land on the runway. And um, yeah. you've got to get the glide path right. And the problem we have at the moment is that, um, you know, there it's like having multiple air traffic controllers with people having different uh, perspectives and whether that's the states or whether that's other commentators out there that are expecting other things. Yeah, everyone wants to uh, land the plane as quickly as you can, but if the glide path too steep, we'll crash, and equally if we overshoot, we'll crash. And so, getting that balance right is a real is a real challenge. Yeah, and um, it it is going to require a lot more thinking, um, both at that kind of national leadership level, but but. Also, as individuals, I mean, it's interesting just talking to some people yesterday about this this question about um, you know the energy load during the middle of the day versus at the at the end of the day. Yep. Most washing machines, etc., now have timers on them that you can set them up to run um, when you're not in the house. Mm. But most people would still wait till they come home and put their load of washing on when they get home at the end of the day, and so they're relying on. A higher cost electricity at that time of day to do the work. Yeah. Um, that so if always they, a chance that it mine randomly, if you don't slam the door hard enough, it flows everywhere. Well, so. yeah, there are risks, right? <laughs> but but there is technology around now that people don't make the most of. Yes. Uh, like most most things, the the uh, the capability of most things we buy today, you know, we we all use, mm. uh, you know, less yep. than ten percent of it generally, and um, sometimes a lot of it's like me, it's more like five percent, but. But, but there are those kind of things. So there's an educational uh, thing here as well. And as we just talked about, there are lots of things that individuals can do, but there are lots of challenges in the way. So, you know, an example of that, you know, local government. You know, I can't put solar panels on my roof of my uh, 
Victorian Terrace House because the heritage overlay mm. stops that yeah. happening because of the impact on the, uh, uh, you know, on the, uh, on the view of the of the of the property. Um, so, you know, what's most important? So I think I think there's a lot of trade-offs that need to be thought through, and and one yep. of the biggest challenges with the energy transition is getting the transmission lines built. And the biggest problem there is nobody wants the transmission lines to run through their uh, their properties. Um, well, that's typically true. Typically, yeah. because of uh, what they look like and the impact of those. And the same thing with wind farms. No one wants to see a wind turbine. Yeah. Everyone thinks wind is great unless they uh, unless they can see it. Because it seems to be a bit of uh, perception and then reality. And one thing that I picked up across the years is when I was looking at houses to buy, if I could see power lines near them or something, it would be like, oh, no, that's no good because of the radiation. Is that even true? <laughs> Did anything come off well, of the lines? Uh, look, there's been lots of studies done about, about um, you know, various radiation. There's been studies done about noise from wind turbines. There's been stu- – so, um, you know, the, the risks are, you know, very small, if anything at all, in most of these situations. And, again, it's a case of uh, – you know, compared to what? I mean, the radiation dose you get from flying is a lot higher than you would ever get from living near a power line. Right. Yeah. And I, I think something you mentioned there just around sort of the transmission wise. So obviously we're putting, um, you know, things that can capture the wind out near the coast is obviously nowhere near wherever it needs to get back to, which is probably going to a traditional, you know, making a beeline for a traditional coal um, operated service. So it, I imagine that would be a huge delay in trying to get, well, if we need to get out to the coast to get this wind power back to the grid, then we've got to go through somewhere to get it. Yeah, um, well, that's, and whether it's offshore, I mean, there, there isn't any offshore in Australia yet for those yeah. kind of reasons, and onshore is much the same because the best places um, mm. to build uh, you know, wind farms means that there are thousands of kilometres of transmission needed. Yeah. In fact, the amount of, investment in transmission that's um, going to be needed to kind of hit some of the targets is equivalent of, of you know, imagine running a, a power line from uh, the westernmost point of Australia to the easternmost point of Australia and then back to Alice Springs. Mm. So, you know, that's the kind of scale of uh, investment. And yep. then when you think about no one actually wants that, those power lines to run through their property. For various reasons, even though there are compensation regimes in place, uh, a lot of people don't care about the money because if you're a, you know, if you've lived on a rural property mm. all of your life, the last thing you want is um, to see uh, those big transmission towers running through your property. And, and then, and then the suggestion, well, we'll just put them all underground is even worse because the the cost is going to be a multiple of what it is, and no one wants a trench built through their yep. property either. So it is a really complex dynamic because I want cheapest energy and I want it all to be natural, <laughs> but the cheapest energy is obviously going to be from a fully depreciated coal service that has the infrastructure there and I don't want to pay for it. If you send me a bill, it's like Qantas asking me to pay for the, I mean, maybe this is my preference, but they say, do you want to do the, the green fee, which is a couple of dollars? I'm like, no, Qantas, you can take that out of your margin. Um, so it's like everybody wants it clean and pure but also cheap yeah and, and, it, and, it, and it's it's a real challenge i know in you know my time at uh in electricity retail we we were uh could provide fully offset um mm. uh yeah, electricity and and gas and telco but um no one wanted to pay any more for it and and across you know we had mm. four odd million customers so absorbing all of that and giving it away for free um, was cost prohibitive. So, yeah. so it's one of those things where, yeah, the challenge between what people would like to have and what they're prepared to pay for, yeah. I think there's a long journey to go on yet. Where as a as a country, where we're up for bearing the cost, and some European countries have done that. You know, Germany is a good example of of where they've been prepared to pay more but there's a lot of unhappy people as well as it actually rolls out and uh um as a you know one of the biggest problems i think we have here is that there hasn't been the amount of transparency that perhaps there should have been about what the cost of transition should be Mm. 
um, because there is the concern that if everyone knows what's going to cost, then people are not going to get on board and therefore it won't happen when yeah. we need to transition for two reasons. One is that the, the, the system that we're relying on at the moment is just going to die. And then the second issue was really the, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the greenhouse gas uh, climate yep. change issues. So there's, it's, there's two, two issues here that we're trying to solve for, not just one. And just to sort of maybe tie tie that in a bow. So if if I'm if I'm running a company and I'm um, looking at okay, what do I need to do? What's one thing I need to th- do or make sure is in place around you know energy transition or just whether it's procurement or is it ESG? Is it not? I'm not sure. What anything you'd say? Just focus on this one thing, and that's probably that might give you well, the most bang for your buck. Yeah, well, make sure it's on your agenda. I think sometimes one of the yep. issues is that, yeah, you know, energy costs only get on people's agendas when prices are very high, uh, in terms of the boardroom or the or the the C suite, and they let the procurement department just look after it. Um, the problem often with procurement departments is they don't want to tell their boss that the prices are going to go up. They're, they're there knocking on the door telling you that they've done a great deal to take prices down. Yeah. But when prices are hitting an upward direction, they tend to be slow to react. And um, you know, what I think that uh, companies and leaders need to do is you know, you know, have a plan. Think about how you actually manage your energy procurement. But not only that, what can you do about energy efficiency? And um, start to do things... Uh, now, or even though the business case might not feel like it's going to be, you know, a uh, you know the best spend of a capital dollar, yeah. Um, you know, but I think that there are ways to start thinking about that, and I think the other thing that businesses need to do, you know, what, what, one of the one of the, one of the things that has to happen is we need to get more rooftop solar penetration, yep. and we need to get storage. You talking commercially or residential? Well, uh, or? residential and commercially. But one of the yeah. problems is that um, if you don't own your house or you don't own the, the the office building you're in or you don't own the factory that you're mm. operating in, you're not going to spend the money to put solar on the roof. Uh, you, mm. you, you, your landlord wouldn't even let you. Yeah. But there's no incentive for landlords to do anything about it. Mm. So I think there's That's a true. regulatory um, political policy gap there somewhere yep. that needs to be filled. But um, so, you know, how can you go about uh, having conversations with whoever owns the building that you're in, um, you know, to make sure that you're going to have access to lower cost energy going forward? Yep. Um, and if you're in the property game, then how can you differentiate yourself by doing some of that that actually sets you up to be in a better position than your competition? Yep. Yeah, because, I mean... It- it's interesting, like landlord, I, I get that dynamic, but even as a home owner, um, and typically my wife and I will stay in a house for three years, despite our best intentions to be there forever. And, you know, there's always another pro- project or something to uh, fix up. But um, it's just, yeah, purely on a numbers game, it's it doesn't really stack up because here's the price, here's the ROI. And by the way, it doesn't really affect my sale value in three years time. So I'll just go and... Yeah, yeah it's and, an... and, and that's where I think yeah, you're right. I mean, the return on if you just do a standard return on investment, um, it isn't going to work. Now, it, it, you might be using the wrong assumption about what you would be paying for your energy hmm. um, if you don't make the investment. And I'd, right. su- I'd suggest you yep. should, you know, use some sensitivities around how you do that. But I think, I think what needs to happen really is, you know, how do you, how do you get a faster depreciation rate, if you like, on that. And maybe that's got to be mm. uh, some policy positions that says, well, you know, you'd pay less stamp duty, for example, if you had yep. more solar, you know, if you had solar on your on your roof and you sold it um, or, or yeah. you bought it, right? Or yep. if you've got, you know, like you day with multiple properties, less less land tax if you've yep. got uh, more energy efficient uh, uh, properties. So there's just got to be ways to actually be a bit smarter around this and to incentivize investment um, in what's going to be necessary, as opposed to disincentivizing by doing nothing. Yeah. Because you know, particularly in in the kind of world we're in at the moment, that discretionary income, you'd much rather make sure that you're getting some value out of that, not just right. uh, you know, an, 
potentially feeling a bit better about it. You'd like to feel good and get some value out of it. Yep. Oh, gosh, great. It comes back to sort of that that national plan. Well, you certainly have, um, I mean, thinking about that last role, the industry, um, the role you were in, um, yeah, certainly that moss to the flame. I thought we were going for a leading from the front, but maybe it's the flame at the front and you're um, you're just you're being attracted to it. So let, maybe let's um, go back to a couple of other scenarios. Cause I, know, I know you've been parachuted in on various scenarios and we've, we've touched on the AGL example. Um, but I, I'd like to sort of maybe tease out why is it that you're the one selected? Um, because it sounds like the AGL, whilst you're the last one from the to- back from the toilet, that wasn't the reason. You obviously had characteristics, experience. You know, what do you think it is that makes you, th- you know, thrusted forward to then be leading from the front? Or yeah, um, yeah. If if I knew all of that, I might have lingered a bit longer <laughs> before coming back into the room on occasions. But I I, I think it builds on itself uh, in the sense that. You know, there is nothing, uh, you know, real practical lived experiences prepare prepare you for the next one. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, the classroom is necessary, but, you know, real life experience, um, you know, is the, you know, is the, is the, the icing on top. I yeah. think that that really makes the, um, gives people the, the confidence that you've, can do it because you've been there and done it before. So yeah. you know it, it, it's one of the, you know, it's one of probably the most frustrating things um, that you know I've been involved with as well. Sitting around the table doing talent management uh, assessments on people, yeah, and and you know talking about you know Sally or John or someone and saying, well, look, they've got really high potential, but they just haven't done the hard yards yet and then as a result of that they kind of don't get the opportunity so it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy that yes. if they if they haven't done a hard job they're seen as not being ready to do a hard job so i think one of the things i'd say to anybody is you know don't shy away from uh, any opportunity where you might be inclined to shy away because you think there's a high probability you might fail so failure is not a bad thing if you learn. Failure is only a bad thing if you don't learn. Um, and so I think I was fortunate that, you know, some of that goes back to that early grounding that I was getting experiences that were in advance of my years, if you like. And that, uh, that helped. And then I also... Um, you know, some by luck, uh, probably a lot less by design. That I was fortunate that I that I was in some challenging experiences and worked with some people, worked with bosses that kind of de- were quite demanding and, mm. and extracted the most from me, and gave me opportunities to do different things. Good bosses, bad bosses. Well, both. well, I think I think uh, I mean, what is a good or a bad boss? Some people say uh, a good boss is someone that doesn't ask too much of you, and I'd say that's probably a bad that's probably a bad boss. Ultimately, mm. you really need to have people that um, well respect you and treat you fairly, but demand a lot of you because that's the only way that you the only way that you learn. Um, and, and then I think the other thing that I had the opportunity to do a number of times was, you know, short, sharp projects where I was kind of taken out of what my day job was and, yeah. and got to work with others on trying to solve problems. So I think I think if you've got a problem solving focus and you're not scared of doing something you haven't done before. And I would say if you don't feel mm. nervous about it, um you're not doing the right thing. You got to almost have sufficient self doubt to drive um, your own performance, um, and you know that's a critical part of learning, I think. And so, you know, to your question, I had a series of those kind of opportunities, um, and it wasn't somehow I managed to get the balance right between not being overly 
um, you know, like the kid in the footy team saying, pick me, pick me. I think if you do that, then you're likely not to get picked. Yeah. So there's an element of, uh, of being, having the right persona about, you know, self-confidence, but not over self-confidence. Yep. And letting your track record speak for you, as opposed to uh, self promotion. So that's that's a tough balance that you that you need to learn, um, yep. and understanding the politics of organisations, and then and then finding people that will be your supporters. Yep. Um, and and I think again, if you go actively looking for them, you're probably doing the wrong thing. Mm-hmm. So I mean, it's a balance. I, I, it, 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 it's there is no silver bullet here. Sounds very organic, almost. Um, yeah, oh, fantastic. Well, thank you, thanks for sharing, Graham. We're going to sort of change um, pace a little bit, and we'll. Um, I've just got a couple of questions. Might throw you off guard here, if um, but who knows? Um, is there a book that uh, that you've read uh, that you'd recommend? Sort of other people pick up, and is there a reason that you'd recommend that book? Um. Yeah, look, if if it's if it's for enjoyment, then I'm a I'm a bit of a a fan of uh, kind of either spy or or murder mystery stuff. Um, but where the characters are very rich, rather than necessarily just the the storyline. So I love the Mick Heron books, the yep. Slow House books or Slow Horses. Oh, yes. that now brought those uh, to the screen. Um, you know, Jackson Lamb's a, a very flawed um, anti-hero, if you like, and all the characters are flawed, um, uh, and I really like that. And then the other ones are I like the Joe Nesbo series, the Harry Hula stories about uh, again Scandinavian uh, 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 police procedural stuff, but with a with a character that's got lots of problems yes. and is very flawed, and there's a lot of richness in under, in thinking about the people. Um, if it's if it's more kind of the textbook stuff, um, whenever I've moved, I've usually found that I've got a whole lot of management books on the bookcase that I've uh, I've bought in an airport somewhere, and I've read the first thirty pages, and then I've fallen asleep, and I can see my boarding pass is about about page thirty or or forty of the thing. So I've, I've been uh, I've been going back reading some of those, although I have to have to say. I found I really love audio books, and I oh, yes. found that I'm much more effective listening than I am reading. I yep. try to stay awake a bit longer, yep. uh, and um, you know, and you can multitask. So uh, I spend a bit of time on the tractor, plowing fields, listening to uh, things, and so uh, uh, you know, some of those. There's, there's um, just can't remember the author, but there's a book called uh, Alchemy. Oh yes, uh, Rory. Somebody is it the uh, alchemist or alchemy? The I think it's I think it's called alchemy. So he's he's an ex um, advertising executive who's really talking about buyer behaviour and you know what 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 drives the psychology of people making decisions. So sort of conscious that yes, you've had a different path to maybe what's on offer at the moment, but. It, any advice you'd give to your younger self um, or maybe an individual like yourself now in the very early stages of their career? Yeah, I think um, I, I, I think that you, you always can learn um, and that, as I said before, failure isn't um, a bad thing provided you learn. I think at the point in time, it sometimes is very difficult to see that. Mm. Um, and there is, you know, and fear of failure drives a lot of behaviour, particularly in, in male leaders. Fear of failure is a, you know, a significant driver or maybe better to say paralyzer of, of uh, many male leaders that just don't want to have a go because they're concerned about the downside. Yeah. So I think, I think, you know, taking risks and being aware of what the consequences of both getting it right and getting it wrong you just got to you just got to do that uh, and but you've got to i think you've got to bring people on the journey with you um mm. and never be afraid to ask for help i had some um some good supporters and some 
what I'd call somewhat passive mentors along the way. But I didn't, you know, if I had my time over again, I'd probably use those relationships um, or um, use as a terrible word. But what I mean is, you know, uh, most have more conversations yep. around what I was going through at the time um, and listen more than I did. I think one of the things that I, that um, uh, didn't help me along the way was that I was um, often more concerned about the welfare of people that were working for me in different situations and crisis situations than I was about my own welfare. Yeah. Didn't seek out help um, and didn't, uh, you know, didn't talk it through or get, you know, psychological support when it made sense to do so. Yeah. And one of the great things today is, you know, the are you okay thing is, is you, know, you know, I wish that had been around, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago. I think yeah. that, that there was too much focus on if you're the leader, you had to prove that you're bulletproof. Yeah. Well, that's right. And, you know, you've got a persona, you're leading from the front, you're taking charge. Um, it doesn't sort of provide a scenario for yourself. It's like, well, actually, I need to just have a check-in with myself. It shows, you know, some weakness you might perceive and... So it's, yeah, I, I can see how that scenario, having that advice for yourself, is that actually okay and just lean on the advice of, of, of mentors because that's, that's what they love to do and share the scars and the, the wounds that you uh, actively share with our communities and stuff now. So it's, yeah, coming full circle, I, I, I yeah. guess. It, 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 it was something that took me a long time to learn, that vulnerability was a good thing, not a bad thing. A yeah. And um yeah, another another book um, had the opportunity to do a um, do the senior development course at London Business School, mm. um, and one of the professors there, Rob Goffey, wrote a book uh, in partnership with someone whose name I can't remember at the moment, but it was called "Why Would Anyone Want to Be Led by You," and it and it kind of delved into those issues around um, vulnerability being one of them. Yep. and um, transparency and honesty um, uh, being, you know, most people were very happy to work for someone that they believe was genuine and was telling them how it is, whether it was good or bad news, as yep. opposed to someone that they thought. And that was one of the most powerful aligning tools and they did a whole lot of empirical research on other on other things, that, you know, what made leaders effective and what didn't. Yeah. And... Um, so I learned quite a lot out of that and had the opportunity to, you know, to spend some time with uh, um, with Rob Goffey at London Business School, kind of working through all of that on the back of a pretty challenging 360-degree process that they put all of the uh, yeah. attendees through to start with. So they were all feeling a bit bruised, I think, before they went into, uh, <laughs> into a process where they helped build you up into something which is hopefully a more, uh, yeah. a more resilient leader in the future. Great. Oh, well, thank you for, for sharing, Graham. We're, we're just about to sort of close, close off the interview. I've got one minute of rapid fire questions, which I'll throw at you, but maybe just an open question back to you, Graham. Just in closing, was there anything I didn't ask you that you thought, um, you know, you might have a, have a comment on or um, an, an area you wanted to share? Yeah, I think I think the you know one of the things about being parachuted into into challenging situations, whether they be turnaround situations or whether whether a leader is just the, the previous leader that might have been well loved by by the organisation has left under whatever circumstances is, you know, thinking about how you prepare yourself for that. And I guess it comes back to what we were just talking about in terms of, you know, being vulnerable, being open and being available to the, you know, the new team so that, um, you know, the, 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 the truth of the situation comes out and, you know, building some alignment. Um, and if it means that more change needs to happen, don't be, don't be afraid of telling people that, well, yes, you know, there, are gonna, there is going to be more change. Not everyone that's in the room at the moment is probably going to be here in three to six months' time. Yeah. Um, but what I, what I can, can't guarantee that you'll all be around, but what I can guarantee is you'll be treated fairly and, you know, I'm available to talk through whatever decisions are made about those kind of changes. So mm. that, that's, that's tough, but it's more tough if you don't actually take that approach to it. Yeah, yeah, be real, I think. Oh, fantastic. Well, thank you for sharing, Graeme. So, yeah, um, 
basically I'll throw as many questions as I can at you in 60 seconds. Uh, well, they're not questions, they're just A or B scenarios, or some people pick C, isn't that as much? Oh, yeah, <laughs> so, do, do all of the above, yeah. It's just sort of what, what, whatever comes into your subconscious. So I've got a little timer here. Okay. Um, ready to go? Yeah, let's go. Yeah, all right, cool. Um, early bird or night owl? Night owl. Oil or gas? Gas. Sweet or savoury? Savoury. Onshore or offshore? Offshore. Comedy or drama? Drama. Horse or lamb? Horse or lamb? Horse. <laughs> yeah. Yes, lots, we've got lots of horses. I thought you might be against yeah. the, well, um, chair or director? Chair. Day or night? Night. Public or private companies? Um, yes. Innovation or optimization? Uh, optimization. Learn more from good or bad boss? Uh, bad. Organic growth or outside capital stimulating investment? Um, organic. Continuous learning or proven methods? Continuous learning. That's it. <laughs> Didn't catch you off guard at all. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, th thank you, Graham, for, okay. your, for your time today. And I'm really looking forward to introducing you into our Perth community soon with the launch of our our new mastermind and looking forward to having you at the helm and chairing that group and supporting the next generation or the current generation of executives. And uh, thanks for being so open and sharing today. And I know we could have gone in so many different directions. So uh, thank you for allowing me to try and keep it uh, contained. And uh, yeah, it's a yeah. very rich experience you have. And thanks for yeah, sharing. Well, well, thanks, Dave. And I, as you say, I think we, we, uh, yeah, there's a few decades we didn't touch. This was probably <laughs> right. might not be a good or bad thing for the for the listeners. Uh, and very much looking forward to uh, leading those groups in Perth. Perth's okay. a special place for me that I spent important parts of my career, and uh, mm. my daughter was born over there, so it was a really uh, important uh, life changing experience for me uh, being in and around Perth. So I'm looking forward to that very much. Fantastic. All right, thanks, Graham. Okay, thanks, Dave.